Tracy Wilkinson had a chance encounter with a man sleeping rough outside her local supermarket. She couldn't bear to see anyone hungry or cold, and she hated to see that this one person had to endure such a hard life without any support or help to change things. So she decided to invite him into her house and show him the true meaning of kindness and care. But in a chilling turn of events, what she was met with after a year of knowing the man was the most brutal and horrific thanks. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This show is made from various documents listed in the show notes. I use news archives, documentary footage and court documents, and so the episodes are accurate to the source materials I can find. Find all the episodes that are on YouTube as a podcast version available in the description box below. This is a true crime case that centres on the kind-hearted actions of one individual and her family, and the callous and deliberate horror that one person inflicted on them. Please stay tuned to the end to hear a survivor's final words on what this case should mean for your support of those who need it most. The market town of Stourbridge is located in Dudley in the West Midlands. Its closest city is Birmingham and part of the black country that sourced its inspiration for Mordor in The Lord of the Rings. Peter and Tracy Wilkinson lived in Stourbridge. They welcomed a daughter, Lydia, and then five years later, a son called Piers. Lydia eventually went off to study physics at Bristol University, and she and Piers remained very close, with Lydia promising to come and pick him up from school when she got her breaks from uni. Their mum, Tracy, was incredibly kind-hearted and extremely passionate about helping others. This manifested mostly when she saw homeless people. She would often bring people who she saw out on the streets hot food and have a chat with them. It wasn't abnormal for her to go out of her way to help people sleeping rough. It was in March of 2016 that Tracy went to her local supermarket and as she was leaving, she saw a man who was sat on the floor in a cardboard box. It was Aaron Barley who was living on the streets and they spoke at length about how Aaron was doing and why he was there. I'll tell you about Aaron's upbringing and childhood but it is important to say that obviously Tracy didn't have all of this information. We don't know the exact ins and outs of their conversation but with all of the details that have come out now I can tell you who this man Aaron Barley was. Aaron's mum had worked in a factory nearby and found comfort in the relationship she had with her uncle, who was almost 20 years older than her. The pair began some kind of an incestuous relationship, where they ended up having a child in 1993, and this is when Aaron was born. The early years of Aaron's life were challenging, to say the least. His dad died when he was just four years old and suffering with cancer, and then, when he was six years old, his mum suffered a heart attack and died, leaving Aaron orphaned and sent into the care system. The following years would see him placed in various different foster homes, and occasionally with different family members. But his time growing up was further damaged by the abuse he suffered, both physically and sexually. At just 12 years old, he had already began rebelling and was reported to be quite aggressive and on occasion violent towards the people he was living with. Things got so bad that he ended up being removed from one of his foster homes. It was around this time that Aaron was also arrested for the first time for grievous bodily harm and that was the start of his criminal record. Over the next year and beyond, he was arrested for multiple drug offences and it's reported that he once stole a car and wrote a hit list of people he decided that one day he would kill. By the time he turned 13, Aaron and two of his friends decided to run away and the police launched a missing persons case for them. Unfortunately, Aaron wasn't missing for too long, but... As soon as he was found, he was returned into the care system once again and unfortunately, things went from bad to worse. Over the next few years, Aaron's behaviour would become more and more challenging. By the time he was 16, he was experimenting with different drugs and drinking to a point of dependence. It wasn't long after that that he found himself sleeping rough, moving from street to street. After Tracy and Aaron had had this conversation outside the supermarket, she knew there was just no way she could leave him there. And so she asked if he wanted to come to her house and have a meal and they could talk through how they would get Aaron back on his feet. 
And so he did come home and she cooked him that meal. And then after that, they went to the local council offices where Tracy continued to work with Aaron to eventually get him into hostel accommodation with the view that he would work towards getting to a point where he could potentially get a job and start earning some money so he could get some stability in his life. And while this was ongoing, Tracy made sure to check in with Aaron every single day and ensure that he had had breakfast and then she would cook him a meal every single evening as well. Tracy likely recognised something of herself in Aaron. She was in recovery for alcohol addiction and at this point in her life, she was a valued member of the volunteer team of the local rehab centre. And so it's likely she knew that she would be able to support Aaron in the way that he needed. And she and the rest of her family spent the following few months supporting Aaron in various ways. He spent time with the family, getting to know them every single day. And Tracy would bring him to AA meetings. And then Tracy's husband, Peter, at one point, gave him a job at one of his businesses in Newport, which is about 90 miles away from Sourbridge. But then tragedy struck. Aaron told Tracy that he needed to admit to something. He had relapsed. Now, Tracy understood this. She understood addiction in a way that only those who have dealt with it can. And she knew that time was critical in getting Aaron back on track. And he told Tracy that the reason he'd relapsed was that his mum had died recently. And this had sent him into a downward spiral. But we know that his mum died when he was six years old. So the real reason why he relapsed just wasn't known. But at this time, both Tracy and Peter had no idea that this was a lie. And all they could do was take Aaron's word for it. They did try and support him over the next few weeks and months, but there was a significant change in Aaron's behaviour. He was failing to even turn up to work. Some days he wouldn't get there at all. Some days he'd get there very late. And on top of that, he began becoming aggressive towards managers and their members of staff. And things got so bad that Peter decided he was going to have to let Aaron go. It's reported that the dismissal of Aaron from the business was amicable. Aaron knew that he'd done wrong. He knew his behaviour wasn't acceptable. And so he had no choice but to accept that he needed to leave. And with this and Aaron's inability to make decisions to help himself, Tracy and Peter decided that they just couldn't help him either. And they actually even ended up eventually losing contact with him. It's unclear who initiated this, but it's likely it did come from Tracy and Peter. However, just a few months later, Peter came outside of his home and he found Aaron asleep in the driveway. And he could tell straight away that Aaron was in a bad way. He had injuries from being beaten up. He had bruises. He looked malnourished. And Peter went inside and spoke to Tracy about what they could do. And they both decided that they couldn't just leave him there out on his own in a bad way. And so they decided to help him. They offered to pay him to do various chores and jobs around the house. And they would eventually help him find a full-time job as a furniture polisher. And they also helped him find accommodation to stay in. But both Tracy and Peter realised that with Christmas coming up and with Aaron most recently having lost his mother, as they thought was the truth, he wouldn't have anyone to spend the Christmas period with. And so they asked if he wanted to spend the holidays with them and with their family, which he said yes to. And on Christmas morning, Aaron went downstairs and he handed Tracy a Christmas card that read, quote, to the mother I never had. Sadly, though, this didn't last for long and Aaron was actually fired from his job. We don't know the reasons why I couldn't find it being reported anywhere, but we do know that this led to him losing his flat. Now, again, there's no specific information on the reason why he lost his flat, but of course, he's not got a job, so there's just no way that he'd be able to afford the rent. Either way, Tracy and Peter offered a bed in their house for the next two weeks, so that he had somewhere to stay whilst he got back on his feet and found another job. They really were doing everything they could. They were going above and beyond. In early 2017, however, 
Aaron went off grid for a few weeks and Tracy and Peter hadn't heard from him. And during this time, they'd been paying his phone contract, but with no word for three weeks, they made the decision to stop paying for his phone contract. And it seemed as though Tracy was becoming worried about Aaron's behaviour generally around this time as well. She told her friend that she'd seen Aaron peeping over their fence one day and she had decided that that really was it for her. She she needed to cut all contact with him. And there's no doubt that this kind of behaviour, Tracy may well have seen what had been happening and been scared of that and what Aaron might do next. Meanwhile, the Wilkinson family life continued on. Tracy was extremely close to her daughter Lydia and being at university was the most time that she'd spent apart from her. And so for Mother's Day 2017, Lydia decided to come home and surprise her mum. Lydia got herself back to the family house and then she got into her mum's Land Rover boot of the car, which was parked outside, and she hid in that boot and waited. And Tracy opened up the boot and she was completely surprised and thrilled to see that Lydia had come home for the day. The mother and daughter were so happy to see each other, in fact, that they shared a little cry and spoke of how lovely it was to be around each other for that day. The next time Lydia would see her mum, however, it would be under the most horrific circumstances. In the early hours of the morning of the 30th of March 2017, CCTV footage from the family home shows a man climbing over the garden fence and attempting to gain entry into the house. He's unable to actually break in and so the man then waits in the back garden until 6.30am when CCTV then tracks him on his hands and knees moving through the grassy area of the garden along the garden wall getting closer and closer to the house. And he'd taken off his light-coloured jacket moments earlier and hidden it under one of the cars so that he wouldn't be seen. And he'd even taken some black socks that he was wearing and pulled them over his white shoes so that he would be less visible. The next footage is from 6.40am and it's of Peter and the dog leaving the house through the back door, leaving it unlocked and heading out for a dog walk. As soon as Peter has gone... The man then enters the house through that same back door. He pulls a balaclava over his head and then he grabs two knives from the kitchen before heading upstairs to where he knew Tracy's bedroom was. He went inside that bedroom and he stabbed her a total of 17 times. And after that, he then left Tracy's bedroom and went through to Piers' bedroom where he also stabbed him a total of eight times. And then he just hid in the house and patiently waited for Peter to return home. And when Peter came through the door, he was a bit confused to ha- to find that there was no one else up and about in the house. And it was unusual because it was time for Piers to get ready for school and Tracy would usually have gotten up and started getting ready for the day, maybe made him a cup of tea for when he got home from his walk. But the tea wasn't out and neither were Tracy or Piers. Sadly, though, Peter wasn't able to wander for long because the man, still wearing his balaclava, lunged towards him with a knife and stabbed him a total of six times whilst also shouting, quote, die, you bastard. After that, the man then left the house. He took the Land Rover keys with him. He stole the car and then reversed out of the driveway and escaped from the house. As the man was leaving, Peter did manage to get to the phone and he dialed 999 and called for help. Thankfully, emergency services arrived relatively quickly and that's when Peter told them that they needed to go and check on his wife Tracy and his son Piers. As emergency services went upstairs, they found Tracy lying naked on her bedroom floor and it was clear to them that she was already dead. And then in the next room, they found Piers in his bedroom. But unlike Tracy, he was breathing. And so they rushed him straight away to Birmingham Children's Hospital where emergency medical assistance was given to him. 
but unfortunately Piers did die shortly after arriving there. The Land Rover that the man had stolen had a dash cam fitted that automatically turned on when the car started and so there was ample footage from that camera that showed his next movements and this along with the heavy police presence near the family home alerted officers and they were able to find the stolen Land Rover by 8.30 a.m. and then a chase ensued. The Land Rover darted through traffic and the police cars turned on their sirens and it chased through the streets. At one point, the Land Rover actually attempts to overtake traffic by driving on the path, but it very quickly crashes into a brick wall and comes to a halt. And that's where police managed to arrest the man inside and there's no surprises that that person inside had already been identified by Peter and now confirmed by police as Aaron Barley. When he was arrested, Aaron told police that he wasn't bothered about, quote, taking one of you with me. He added that he had, quote, chopped them up and didn't need a solicitor. He said that he only regretted not killing Peter and he showed no remorse. Meanwhile, across in Bristol, Lydia got a call from her boyfriend and he told her that she needed to turn on the news. There had been an incident in Stourbridge and... It looked like the pictures coming up were of her house. And when Lydia saw the pictures, she realised that, yeah, it, it definitely was her house. But outside was different. There were forensic teams and crime scene tape. Something bad had definitely happened. She immediately called the police to find out what was going on. And that's when she learnt that her brother and her mother were dead and her dad had been rushed to hospital and they didn't know how he was gonna be. They didn't know if he was gonna make it. Peter was taken into intensive care and Lydia joined him there and he was in intensive care for a total of six days. And thankfully, he was then determined to be in a stable condition and he stayed in hospital for a further five days after that before being discharged with Lydia by his side. Over the following weeks and months, the investigating team began to build their case against Aaron. They found that on his Facebook, he'd posted a number of worrying posts. One said, quote, to all my family that haven't spoken to me for years, go fuck yourselves. And another said, quote, got to try and get some help before I go on a killing spree. He spoke about wanting to kill and he also spoke about wanting to know what it felt like to specifically kill with a knife. As part of the investigation, they also looked into Aaron's criminal record and they found that when he was just 18 years old, he was arrested and given a three and a half year prison sentence. And this particular charge was for brutally beating his partner at the time with a piece of wood, which he then broke off and attempted to stab her with. The partner was badly hurt, but there was ample evidence to convict him. So he was sentenced, but as we know, just to three and a half years. So by the time he was out, he was only 21 years old. And it was just a year after that, or just over a year after that, that he then met Tracy outside that supermarket. Aaron's defence spoke about his upbringing and chaotic childhood and they tried to determine diminished responsibility as a defence based on psychiatric tests that were undertaken. But of all of the psychiatrists that examined Aaron, none of them could determine any kind of specific disorder that would warrant diminished responsibility. Ultimately, Aaron pled guilty to two counts of murder and one of attempted murder, and he was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 35 years. I mentioned at the beginning of this episode about a survivor speaking on what had happened, and so I wanted to share Lydia's words with you now. Quote, I would always encourage people to go through charities and organisations specifically set up for that kind of thing. These charities know the system and they have the correct vetting processes in place. There are a lot of people out there who are in some unfortunate situations and need help. And it is an amazing thing to be able to help them. Thank you for listening or watching this episode of Red Rum. I appreciate you being here. And I wanted to just end this video with 
something untrue crime related but thriller related for sure and um, i've been reading a lot of thriller books recently and i wanted to take some time at the end of each video to recommend a book or a film or something that i've um, engaged with recently that i've really enjoyed so this is my recommendation today it is the house across the lake by rayleigh riley sager sager unsure should have looked that up before i start recording well prepared great um but i'm really enjoying it i'm near the end now um, and I have no idea how it's going to end. I keep thinking that I know what's going to happen and then it uh, changes. Something completely different happens, um, which are always the best books or films. So that is my recommendation for this week. Next week, I'll recommend something different, maybe a film or something. Anyway, I will see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.